Prim Show. With your hosts, Sam Prim and Lucas Wall. We're talking about free. Hello and welcome to the Faster Freedom Show. My name is Sam and you are either lucky or unlucky, whichever way you look at it. Glass half empty, glass half full, guy or gal. You got me today. I'm going solo today. Lucas is down in Miami at at an event with his wife relaxing and chilling. And I thought, been out a little bit recently, so I wanted to do this one solo. Got a, a banger of an episode for you today. Going to talk about how to create wealth. I'm going to go over some current headlines. Going to do deal of the week going to talk about my very first flip that I ever did like fix and flip and sell it was a burn house it was a a nightmare to put it lightly so we're going to talk about that as well and then give you some motivation at the end so we got quite the episode for you today and you get to hang out with me which is exciting if you're joining us on um, YouTube or Facebook or even X that's where we stream live make sure to chat in the comment box and and let let me know where you're from if you have any questions I'll gladly take a quick break uh, with what I'm talking about to answer your questions there Um, so let me know if you're if you're on there and uh, how things are going there Um, but for now let's talk a little bit about the uh, the the faster uh, freedom fest so Faster Freedom Fest is, uh, where were we pointing there? <laughs> okay. Uh, Faster Freedom Fest is an event we're hosting in St. Louis. It is in my office May 9th and 10th. Um, we're keeping it pretty intimate and small. It is not like any other in-person event you will see out there. Most in-person events, and, and not trying to hate on them too bad because I talk at a lot of them, are, you know, like, 10x where you got floyd mayweather and you got tyler perry and you got you know alex rodriguez and all these people that made literally hundreds of millions of dollars outside of real estate or like small like entrepreneurial type businesses um they made them being professional athletes or being actors or actresses that's not really relatable for me and you normal people that don't have hundreds of millions of dollars to kickstart a business so what i'm doing is is i'm taking a step back and we are we are going to have me and my team speak and guide and show you everything um personally how to do it we're going to have it in my office two days me and my team are the speakers you know the people that are actually doing it normal everyday people that are actually doing it is who you're going to be getting access to um, for those two days it's a it's a few hundred bucks it's really cheap so if you have interest in that uh, go to fasterfreedomfest.com or shoot me a message on Instagram. I'll send you some information. There are still seats available, um, but I don't know how much because we're not going to have 500 people here, right? We're going to have 100-ish people um, in the room to hang out for those couple days, and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun to hang out in my office. So uh, if you want to move things to the next level and you're willing to spend a couple days in, in beautiful St. Louis, if you're in the area or um, can drive or fly in, um, it's going to be a lot of fun for you know a couple hundred bucks, and May is a beautiful time in St. Louis. So that's a freedom fest that we're going to chat about um but what i want to talk about now is how to create wealth um so many people are not defining how to create wealth properly i I, this has been on my mind recently there's a uh, a quote i saw uh, from albert einstein and he said that if he has 60 minutes to solve a problem he's going to spend 55 minutes truly defining the problem and then five minutes um, actually solving the problem. So that's just a little bit of an analogy for me. And and everybody thinks they want to create wealth or they think that they can create wealth or should create wealth, whatever that is, and that, that's fine, but they don't understand the true uh, problem or solution or the true foundation of, of wealth creation. Um, it's one of those things that it's just, if you truly understand the basic foundational concepts, just like if you truly understand a problem, you are more likely, in my opinion, Opinion, to be able to actually solve it. So I'm getting ready to uh, go up on the whiteboard uh, here in a little bit and uh, here in a minute actually and show you um, and talk through a little bit about um, how to create wealth and, and show you some some examples and some things like that. But before I do that, want to kind of uh, define this because creating wealth is actually very, very simple. 
there's a difference between simple and easy. Um, you know, uh, uh, easy is something that can anybody can do. Simple is something that anybody can understand. Now, just because it, it, it's simple doesn't mean it's easy. Now, there are things that are simple and easy at the same time, but but creating wealth is not one of them. Fortunately, though, uh, creating wealth is very, very simple. The concepts I'm going to go over here in a minute, show on the whiteboard and walk through how to create wealth and then how to parlay that into real estate is going to be extremely powerful for you. I've done this quite a few times and every single time I'm get eyebrow raised and, and, and people, you know, realizing that it is very, very simple. So excited to go through that with you all here in a minute. And then um, in general, we're just going to kind of break that down in, in as many ways as possible. So that being said, let's let's hop up to the whiteboard. First time we're going to try this and we'll see how she goes. There you go. Get the speaker on here. Get this going. Boom shakalaka. All right. We good? We see me? Thumbs up. All right. So wealth creation, like I said earlier, is very, very simple. I'm going to be like staring at Shane the whole time. It's going to be great. Wealth creation, I'm talking to you, is very, very simple, but it's not easy. Um, wealth is created through assets. So assets are what creates wealth, whether that be business assets, like a, a actual business that you own. Um, you know, Elon Musk's wealth is through, I'm sure he owns real estate, but his, actually I think he's, um, he's like doing this minimalist thing where he's selling all his real estate. But anyways, his wealth is created through his equity in Tesla, his equity in X, his ec the, not just X, the actual platform, his equity in, um, in, in the businesses that he owns fully or partially owns, that's where his wealth is created. Um, and and you, know, you can do that through real estate or through businesses. And, and technically, I guess if you wanna get this exactly accurate, so um, wealth is created through equity in assets, like just having an asset that you have a mortgage on or you have a note on if it's a business and the business or real estate's not worth any more than the note you have on it, that, that's, not, that's not a way to create wealth. That's a way to do it the wrong way. So creating equity um, in assets is the way to create wealth. I don't think anybody can argue that. Um, you know, creating um, equity some way, somehow, is, is the best way to create wealth, whether that's through real estate or business. Now, if you don't have enough money to buy those assets, um, are you SOL or do you have options? And that's what we're gonna talk about today is option. This is how to create wealth using none of your own money, which is, is, a, is an interesting concept. That's kind of what I'm known for. Uh, that's what I've done. It, it, it's what people I know have done. It, it's, it's what students have done. Um, and it's what most self-made multimillionaires and billionaires do is they figure out how to create that wealth with none of their own money. Definition of self-made meaning you're, you're, you didn't inherit it. You made it yourself. And while you do that, you still use it leverage to a certain degree. So what we're going to talk about is the ABCs of wealth, okay? So ABC, sorry my writing is uh, not good. You're just going to have to uh, have to get used to it. Kyle? Again, my writing sucks, so listen as I'm speaking. Uh, C stands for cash flow. So these are the three major concepts and, and components that we're going to talk about when we're going to talk about creating, um, creating wealth. So let, let's clear that out and let me show you um, how, how this actually looks. So let, let's put the B for borrow, A for asset, C for cash flow. So again, this is very simple. We're gonna build upon this. I'm gonna use some business examples. Then I'm gonna break this down and show you how you can do it because understanding this concept is great and I think it will open your mind up a little bit, but understanding how this actually works for, um, you know, for you, and if you're listening um, to this after the fact, it, it, I'll, I'll talk you through it, but um, understanding how this works um, and then understanding how to implement it are, are two different things. So what you do is you, you borrow money to buy an asset. An asset by definition is something that is going to um, be produce cash and potentially hopefully grow in value. So you borrow money to buy an asset. You take the cash flow that that asset produces and you pay back who you borrow the money from. It's that simple. You borrow money to buy an asset. You take the cash flow from the asset to pay off who you borrowed the money from. Now let's go over some business examples and then we'll narrow it down to real estate because I don't know that everybody's going to start doing this technically with, um, you know, with, with, uh, with a business. So like uh, my big example I like to use is, is uh, Mark Zuckerberg. So Mark Zuckerberg borrowed money 
from Peter Thiel and other investors, but the big main angel investor was Peter Thiel, 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 whatever you want to call it. He borrowed money from him to make Facebook uh, an actual business. He had started it in his dorm room with some buddies. Uh, it had a cool concept, it had some momentum, but it wasn't a business yet. They didn't have the, the manpower, the funding to hire more coders, more developers, and, and create more of a product that is eventually scalable and sellable or, or monetizable. So Zuckerberg borrowed money from Peter Thiel to make Facebook uh, more of a business. Then he took the ad revenue, AKA cash flow to pay back Pierre Thiel. Now, uh, that Pierre Thiel got um, some ownership in, in Facebook, so good negotiation on his part, but not everybody that invested in Facebook got ownership at the beginning. So, in general, he took somebody else's money to make a business more monetizable, took the monetizableness from that business to pay off who he borrowed the money from. Um, you know, similarly with, um, with X, when, when Elon Musk bought X, he borrowed money to buy it. $44 billion famously um, that, that he bought X for now. He used some of his own money, not a ton, he used some of his stock and leveraged some of his stock in Tesla, but then he got a ton of investors. Um, that, that there's a whole thing online, we can see all the investors and all the people that, that spent hundreds of millions and, and tens of millions of dollars to, to invest in X, invest in Elon, honestly. And then he borrowed money from Bank of America and a couple other banks, but Bank of America was a big lender on this. So even Elon Musk, who could have written a $44 billion check or cashed out stock that were worth that much amount, he didn't do that. He, he, he took money and he's trying to make X something completely different. We won't get into that a little bit, but that this is how this is how the world works. If you don't have enough money to buy something, you can borrow money to buy that something. The credit business, the, the debt business, the, the leveraging business is how the world's economy runs. Um, that's how every, every country, every, every business, pretty much for the most part, uh, gets their start or gets their growth by borrowing money that they don't have and, and they tie it to the asset that they're borrowing money to improve or grow or start. So. That's the general concepts, A, B, C. You borrow money to buy an asset, take the cash flow from the asset to pay off who you borrowed the money from. So that's, that's, the, that's the simple part of it. Now again, it's not easy, but it, it is a way to, uh, to, to make this whole thing work. So what I wanna do now is talk about how you can actually do this because I, I understand this is a cool concept. This is probably something that you, you either thought of or you haven't thought of, but I would assume to some degree it, it makes sense, but what do you do with this information? So let's talk about how you do this uh, with real estate, uh, because I think everybody can agree that real estate is a great, is a great wealth creation tool. Uh, putting your money in the stock market um, is not a way to create wealth, it's a way to get a little bit of potential active income. I actually just saw a stat, this is gonna, uh, this is gonna blow the young cat's minds over there in the corner, but, um, of the S&P 500, um, do you know how many companies in the S&P 500 have been around for 75 years? Out of the 500 companies in the S&P 500, how many do you think? What's your guess? One. One company, GE, has been on the S&P 500 for, um, for the last 75 years, which is just going to show that unless you're investing completely a blanket account in all the stocks in the S&P 500, which some people are, but most people have their specific stocks, that's not a secure way to do anything because they go in and out of the S&P 500 because companies are ran by people and people make dumb decisions and people don't adapt. Real estate is, there's no emotion involved. It, it, it's siding, it, it's, it's brick, it, it's, it's mortar, it's, it's shingles, it's doors. It is an actual hard, tangible asset that's ran hopefully probably just by you were one management company. So there's less, less human error to go into it. So that's why real estate is the best choice. That's why it's the best place to get started. I would suggest getting involved in real estate then maybe potentially moving on to businesses. But the best, simplest, easiest thing to do is to start with real estate. All right, so how this works with real estate is you borrow money from a private lender, we'll get into this a little bit, little bit here in a minute, hard money lender and then local bank um, in a certain order to, uh, to buy the asset, which is going to be a house, a rental house to be more, a little bit more specific. Then you take um, the cash flow, AKA rent, 
and equity that's created over a short period of time to pay back who you borrowed the money from, the private lender um, and hard money lender through the equity, and then you know you pay the bank back through the rent. So a little more convoluted, we're gonna work through that, but basically when it comes to real estate, uh, it's uh, you know a few more steps, but it's just so much simpler because everybody needs real estate. I think the real estate industry is like 46 trillion. It is ginormous. So you borrow money um, to, to buy a, a rental house for simplicity purposes. Purposes. Then you take the cash flow from that rental house to pay off who you borrowed the money from. At the end of the day, you own that rental house, which is an asset, which over time equity is created through, which what does equity and assets do? Builds wealth. You were going to say that, weren't you, Shane? All right, cool. All right, so all right, now let's talk about the, the method used to, to do this. It is a very, very, um, again, uh, pretty simple method. It's not quite as easy as ABC. There's a few more letters involved, but let's break this down. I love this method. I have used this Burr's method that I'm getting ready to break down for you to buy 150 single family houses, um, six uh, uh, apartment complexes, uh, three self-storage facilities and a hotel and a commercial building that we're in. I have used this method to buy all of those things. So this isn't your, your grandpa's Burr method. This is the Burr's method with an S. This is a way to buy any real estate asset you want using none of your own money. Now, of course, you have to um, buy the asset at a discount, which we're gonna get into. Of course, you have to manage the asset well, but if you buy this asset right and manage this process well, you will be able to create wealth through real estate using none of your own money. So all real estate investing deals, whether you're, you're flipping it or, or you're keeping it as a rental, need two things. You need a distressed house, and you need a, uh, a money lender on the initial side. So to keep this simple, let's say this is a private lender. Everybody on here knows how to find private lenders. I have a ton of content on social media, how to find private lenders. Uh, if, if, if you ever after this wanna go over to Instagram and shoot me a message, I'll send you a training on private lenders. But private lenders are pretty easy to find if you know where to look, just very few people know where to look. So let's say we have a private lender and we find a distressed property, okay? We're, we're talking concepts here. Don't wanna get in too much of the nitty gritty on um, each little piece of this. Let's, let's get clear on the bigger picture. So let's say you, you, um, bar, you, you can buy a house for $150,000, the buy. After looking at pictures, getting bids, talking to other investors, it needs uh, about $40,000 worth of work. So what you need to buy this property is $190,000. That's what you need to buy and fix up the property. Now, you go from a, you go to a private lender and you can again do a ton of different options, but let's just stick with the let's just stick with the uh, private lender for simplicity purposes. Your private lender writes you a check for $190,000. You then go write the title company a check for $150,000, and then you write checks basically to contractors to rehab the property for another $40,000. So you borrow $190,000 from a private lender and you utilize that to buy and repair the property. So now the house is fixed up. You still owe the private lender money. We're gonna get him or her their money back very, very soon. They didn't do it out of the kindness of their heart. They, they want their money back plus interest. Um, so now that you have a, a, a fixed up property that is beautifully rehabbed, you get the property rented. You start to produce that cash flow that we talked about in that ABC. Now, the beautiful thing about today's market and the world that we're living in today is there are so many options. Real estate is so, so powerful. So there are so many options when it comes to renting the property. You can, if it's the right area, the right, uh, the right uh, location, um, the right township, you can rent out on a short-term basis. You can rent this dang thing out on a, a weekend or weekly basis on Airbnb. More management, but way more cash flow. So that's an option to get that cash flow where you need it to be because interest rates are a little bit higher. The thing that I'm super excited about going forward is midterm rentals. You can rent these properties out on a midterm basis um, to traveling nurses, corporate leases, insurance displacements. There is, um, you know, two to three million um, needs uh, right now for uh, midterm rentals, and there's about 200,000. Um, so the uh, supply, there's about 200,000 worth of um, supply of midterm rentals. So the demand is two to three million and the supply is 200,000. That's why you can cash flow and that's why it's a, it, you have a, a really good option to get um, double the rent that you get on a long-term basis, which is the other option. You can rent it out um, on a 12, 24 month lease to market rent on Zillow or to section eight, doesn't really matter. Either way, you're in that long-term tenant. So you have options to rent the rental property out to start to produce that cash flow. 
with me so far? You borrowed money to buy and fix up a property. You got the property rented out to whatever is the best renter to you. And then now is when we start to do the fancy footwork shuffle. So this is the refinance step. This is when you take your, your, your fixed up rented rental property to a small local bank, okay? Now that small local bank will write you a check for up to 80% of the appraised value. Now, you bought this property at a discount because it was sad and distressed. You fixed it up, so you added a ton of value. Um, if you ran your numbers right, did everything properly, this property, and this is a real life example, we're rounding a little bit, but in general, the numbers are, are all even out to some real examples we've done recently. Um, uh, uh, the property appraises and is worth $250,000, okay? So you, you took the property and you um, uh, took it to a bank and they appraised it and they wrote you a check for 80% of the appraised value. 80% of 250000 is $200,000. So the bank literally will hand you a cashier's check telling you there's so much money sitting on the sidelines waiting for this, you just have to get the deal. So they'll write you a check for $200,000. You take that $200,000 check and you pay back your private money lender, they're 190 grand that they paid you, plus for the simplicity purposes again, 10 grand in interest on this deal. So the private lender's happy now, because the private lender gave you 190, didn't have to lift a finger, do any re rehabbing, negotiating, um, any any managing contractors, nothing, and then you gave them a check back for 200,000 five six months later. It's a really really good return for them. They're happy. They're paid off. They now have the uh, appetite and ability to do this again with you. That's the repeatability factor and scalability factor of this. Now, you do owe your tenant, or you do owe the, the rent, spoiler alert, um, uh, the rent, you do owe the bank $200,000. So you owe them that, they gave you a check for that, but now it's a loan, you pay them back over the next 25, 30 years. Fortunately, you're collecting rent because you got the property rented before you took it to the bank, and the rent pays back um, the bank every single month, plus any other own expenses, plus a little bit of positive cash left over, depending on which renter you actually get into place there. So um, it, it's, it's a way to, we'll get to scale here in a second, but it's a way to own one asset, one rental property, so you have this nice fixed up rental property, this happy property that, that is uh, you know going to create wealth for you. It's gonna create wealth for you because over time, that property's gonna go up in value. You're not gonna have to do a thing. You're gonna have to maintain it with the tenant's rent, but that property is going to go up in value over time. Real estate doubles in value every 15 years, um, a minimum of double in value. So real estate, so that property is going to go up in value. It's not like picking and choosing which of the S&P 500 companies are going to remain around for 15 or 20 years because those that's a revolving door. Real estate's not a revolving door. So that property is going to go up in value um, in 15 year time span. It, it may dip, it may fluctuate a little bit, but overall the aggregate's going to be a lot higher than what it is today. So the property is going to go up in value, which creates equity for you, which creates wealth for you. The other beautiful thing is you have a mortgage on the property, so you have debt. The debt is getting paid down by the tenant. So you are getting double the equity because the property goes up in value over time and every single month, whether the value fluctuates or not, the tenant is paying down the principal balance on the mortgage plus all owning expenses. Then you get tax free, or then you get you get uh, tax free cash flow um, if you're uh, depreciating this and utilizing the tax benefit. So it's called the passive wealth trifecta. I like to call it. You get uh, property growth debt pay down plus cash flow all at the same time. And then um, to top it all off, you get the you know you get the tax, you get a, a sheltered tax, um, you know. Uh, asset. So over time, the, the, it creates a lot of value. Let me show you kind of numbers what those means, then we'll get into scale. So the property that we just talked about is worth 250 k today. All right. You owe 200000 on it. I don't know why I make my twos different, but I did. So you have 50 k in equity today. That, that's pretty cool. Um, it was hard work getting this uh, property. I understand the, what your first rental property is going to be crazy hard. Um, you're going to have to work really hard to negotiate, get the deal. You're going to screw up. There's going to be headaches and issues, and that is why um, you know that's why we have a community and a mentorship because this is really hard, um, and we help people make it a little bit easier. But regardless, whether you are in my community or any community or not, it's going to be a lot of work. But let me just show you why it's worth it. First off, you 50k richer, um, 50k equity off the bat. You didn't put 50 grand cash into it, but you got 50 grand equity. And I told you real estate doubles in value every 15 years. So 15 years from now, this $250,000 property is going to be worth 
500,000, so it's going to go up in value. It may be worth 265 next year, then it may go down to 258, then it may go up to 270, 280, down to 275, but overall, it's going to go up in value and double. But the other side of it is you're getting, I, I always think of one of those uh, you know, math problems in high school or college where they're like, you have a starting point here, one train moves this way at this speed, the other train moves this way at this speed, um, how much distance is created? And I've never got those right, but it goes, just goes to show that it, if one thing is helping you, you'll get decent growth, but if you have two things helping you at the same time, it, it you know, can double or triple your growth. So again, this property is getting get paid down to conservatively $100,000. So your 50 K in equity that you got using none of your own money will easily turn into a minimum of 400 K in equity in just 15 years, which I know 15 years isn't a short period of time. These guys in the corner have been alive about that long. However, um, it, it is pretty much a, a guarantee that it's going to happen. And it's one of those things where the average IRA and 401k combined um, don't make up 400,000. So people work for a company for 35, 40 years, and sometimes, their IRA and 401k don't even equal 400,000. Obviously, sometimes they do, but a majority of the time they don't. Or especially if you're, you know, 30 and you know you do this, and by the time you're 45, you're not going to get 400k in those things. So that is the beauty of this. You can do this multiple times with as many rental properties as you want, but $400,000 plus cash flow along the way is 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 the goal. And obviously, you, you extrapolate this out another 15 years. Um, you know, get to 30 years out, it's worth a million bucks and you're going to owe zero. So you're going to have a million dollars equity. Um, so you're going to be a millionaire, which in 30 years is not going to get you super far, but you're going to be a millionaire um, in 30 years and with your other investments and your other things that you're doing and your job and your IRA or 401k that you do have and your personal house. And maybe you do this two or three times, you're going to be sitting very, very good and be able to really, really enjoy your retirement or retire early if you do this multiple times. There are ways to do it specifically for real estate, but this translates to other businesses. You need to create the, I created an acronym um, for the scale. You need to create systems around every single step. If you create systems, you know, the scaling means bigger, better, faster, stronger, more, right? So if you want to um, scale your rental properties, you need to create systems around buying houses. You need to create systems around rehabbing houses so you can be more efficient and do six in a year rather than four in a year because you got efficient and you turn them quicker. You need to create systems around rehabbing or, or around renting. You need to get the property rented quickly so you can collect cash, so you can do the refinance, so you can reuse that money and recycle that money. And then, of course, you need to create systems around refinancing and different uh, entities to refinance with. So create systems around the process to scale. You need to get involved in some type of coaching, whether it be a, uh, like a community that you're involved in, like a free real estate investing meetup, you need to get involved in coaching, uh, preferably pay for it to somebody. I, I don't know anybody that's moderately successful even to greatly successful that doesn't pay to be around other successful people or learn from other successful people. The name of the game, how do you, how, there's no shortcut to wealth except following others uh, proven path. And then the, the A stands for action. You have to go out and take action. And yeah, that goes without saying, but does it? Because um, you need to, you're not going to learn enough sitting on the sidelines. You're not going to learn enough by watching videos or listening to my podcast, YouTube, get my book, the faster, or the, my book, Own Your Freedom. That's all great, but you're not going to, you're not going to um, learn unless you're actually doing it. So if you want to scale, you have to actually do it and be involved in it. Um, the L stands for lead flow, whether you're talking, um, you know, uh, you know, a lawn care business or real estate investing business, you need more leads. So you need to focus on creating leads to fill up your funnel. And then the E is extra funding. Not only does it make the word scale, not scalp by putting funding, extra funding is, is important because you need multiple funding sources extra. You can't scale with one private lender. You need multiple private money lenders, hard money lenders, lines of credit, things like that to really scale this. And then you need extra funding on the refinance step. Small local banks have legal lending limits. They can legally lend you, so you need multiple uh, funding sources at all of the steps. So creating wealth is not is not easy, um, but it, or it's not it, yeah it's not easy, but it is simple. It's a it's something that takes time, but we're creating wealth here, not widgets, is what I tell my students all the time. Yes, this is not this is going to take some work. Yes, this is going to require you to do things a little bit differently. Yes, it's going to require you to put an extra effort here and maybe sacrifice this or that. But it's worth it because it is the most proven, consistent path to creating wealth. You're not you're not creating a system and, and prioritizing yourself and really 
ridiculous and you're not you're not like prioritizing and changing and taking this big risk on this this altcoin or something or you're, you're not getting into e-commerce or something like that this it works for some but not all and it's not proven it hasn't been around that long real estate's been around as long as people have been around so real estate's a proven uh, something that everybody needs and if you can latch on to that by creatively using other people's money to create that asset that creates that equity that creates that wealth that's something that we all can sink into that's why three million follows on social media because i'm just a normal dude from the midwest middle class that's been able to create a lot of really cool things because i understand the, the you know the abcs of wealth and the properly leveraged concepts that that we all can utilize this isn't something that only few people can do anybody watching this or listening to this can do this now of course it does take some um, you know some time and some people's paths will be quicker than others some people will do this in three months we have students buy five properties in the first five weeks and we have students buy none in the first five months so it all depends on your goals your time your ambition your drive but if you have those things and you have a hopsicle of you know not a great job or not a ton of time or you know maybe not the best credit score this can all be cobbled together and work for pretty much anybody so if you like that, make sure to like this video um, and share it with a friend. Let's get back to the to the main uh, part of the show. Get sit back down here. So hopefully you learned a little bit of that. Hopefully that was decent for you uh, for the uh, for the radio audience. Um, we back to main mic. All right. Hopefully that was uh, hopefully that was decent for the radio audience um, uh, listening. You know. Hopefully I described it good enough, but if not, just go check it out on YouTube. It's going to be the whole episode's dropped on YouTube. We're also going to cut up that exact segment and put it on YouTube. So if you're listening uh, or watching live, just know that you're going to be able to rewatch this when we uh, release this on YouTube uh, here very shortly. But um, also it's on all podcast platforms, um, both, uh, you know, uh, visually and uh, and audioly. I don't think audioly is a word, is it? No. Okay. Shane says it's not a word. Okay. So hopefully you learned a little bit there. That RGI school was fun. So what I'm going to do now is uh, go over some recent headlines, and then we're going to dig in a little bit and talk about the, the deal of the week, which is my very first fix and flip. All right. So headlines. The first headline is Trump's newest venture, a $60 Bible. So I, I think some of you probably have seen this and, um, we don't get political on here very much. Um, but anyways, uh, days before Easter, um, Trump encouraged supporters to buy his God bless the USA Bible. Although technically Trump's not selling, it's kind of an affiliate thing. He's It's not like it, the Bible has, you know, says like, which honestly wouldn't surprise me. It doesn't say like written by Donald Trump on the inside. Um, but it, it, he's basically just getting a, an affiliate link for it um, and getting paid for ever, a little bit for everything that's sold. So um, it, it's apparently helping him with his um, bond on his um, New York case civil fraud Um case. It is $175 million bond, which is which is crazy in itself. Um not not picking any side here, but I, I I read the other day, and I think this is true that Bernie Madoff, who literally is one of the biggest Ponzi scheme people ever, you can have your views on Trump um, as far as that goes, but he didn't like create a Ponzi scheme like Bernie Madoff did, um, and uh, Bernie Madoff's bail was ten million, so it's kind of wild that uh, Trump is uh, catches a lot of arrows, uh, probably some. Um, rightfully so and, and some maybe not but regardless um he's he's selling the, the the trump bible is what people are calling it i don't know if it's necessarily a, a, a trump it's actually a trump bible but it's just has the king james bible and then it's got some um some some u.s constitution stuff the bill of rights declaration of independence and pledge of allegiance so it's a a unique marketing technique um which uh which he he he's very good at marketing obviously he, his name is known worldwide he's the most famous, if not the most close to the most famous person in the world, him and him and Taylor Swift and Kanye West kind of kind of and, and maybe some of the, the footballers, Ronaldo and them are all the, the most famous spoken people in the world. So uh, interesting. Um, I, I, I don't really um, you know, it is what it is. I'm not like super offended by it. I don't think it's the coolest thing in the world, but uh, a $60 Bible that mixes the US uh, a and the Bible. Um, and then, you know, uh, it's got Trump's name uh, uh, at least associated with it enough to to make uh, to make some money. And he's probably going to make a lot of money on because a lot of people are going to do that because people love the Bible. People love the USA, and uh, a lot of people love Trump. So uh, it's it's a match made in heaven for some others. It's going to greatly offend, but it is what it is. So, anyways, that that was an interesting, fun little thing. All right. So the second um, 
Second headline I want to talk about a little bit is um, California has increased its fast food minimum wage to $20 an hour, which uh, in California doesn't really get you very far. Uh, The minimum wage has not gone up very much over the past few decades. It definitely hasn't increased with inflation or cost of living. So there's that to it. Um, But also, I mean, Anything California does is is a little bit of an eye roll for me. Um, I know in in California, um, if you own a piece of property and you rent it out to somebody, you're not really allowed to screen them uh, for you know, fair housing uh, purposes, but then they can literally pay you zero rent and live there for a year. So um, they have more rights than the owners of the property. So not only do tenants have more rights, than owners of a property. Um, Squatters who aren't paying have more rights than owners of a property. So again, obviously this is a real estate focused podcast. I want to throw that in there a little bit, but I mean, again, the eye roll of the eye roll of, you know, the California in general, and and I don't know that they do much right over there. Uh, I don't think many people even agree with most of what California does. So um, anyways, the the minimum wage has been increased. So what is that? What that means is that the person who's buying the fast food is going to have to pay more. Um, That's not a huge margin business. I've seen behind the scenes of some of those like Taco Bell, McDonald's and things like that. The the margins are pretty slight. Uh, Obviously, they're profitable, but having to pay eight workers at Taco Bell, another, you know, however many dollars an hour versus however many hours in a day, it's going to cut into the margins and it's, they're not nonprofits and they want to hit their margins for their stakeholders, for their investors. So that quesadilla is going to go from 299 to uh, 349 and that, uh, that, that uh, cinnamon uh, twist crunches are going to go from 99 cents to, to 129. And obviously I'm just throwing numbers out there, but the prices are going to go up. So the own, the, the people are paying to pay other people more. The corporations, uh, whether you agree with it or not, are not going to be taken on the chin. They're going to pass the expenses on to other people. That's part of the, the benefit of owning a business. You decide your prices uh, when you own real estate. If, if insurance starts to cost more, if real estate taxes start to cost more, might even your margin a little bit and or you can bump up your rent or rent it out on a midterm basis or a short term basis. So. Uh, most of the cost of doing business gets uh, passed along to the person that is spending the money with the business owner, whether we're talking real estate or whether we're talking Taco Bell or uh, whatever we're talking. That That's kind of the, the way that it works. So I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Let me know in the chat box if, if you're watching what your thoughts are on California fast food uh, wage increase. But there we go. And then uh, an interesting one here, we got um, small business optimism hits a 12-year low. It has not been this low since 2012, which basically means they they do polls all the time for stuff like this. And for a good reason, um, small businesses um, have uh, are less optimistic than they've been um, in in 12 years since December of 2012. Um, The biggest reason for that is inflation. Um, Inflation is is, is sticky right now. We just got an inflation report that it went up to three and a half percent. So inflation while three and a half percent is not like anything crazy scary it's more than it's more than what the government wants but it's it's you know it's you know or the fed i guess which government whatever you want to call it but it's more than what's wanted however it was below that so the the the, you know inflation ripped up to 9.3 or whatever it was then it ripped back down to you know three and a half and then got down close to three and now it's back up to three and a half so um the fact that this was kind of one of those fears of people there was three scenarios inflation was going to um, remain high it was going to go low and stick or was going to go low and then kind of rebound back up so this is not a very good scenario for many things especially uh small business owners who uh have products that they have that they can only charge so much for um that you know again the 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 cost gets passed on to the consumer like i just mentioned in the last headline but in this case there's only so much that somebody's going to pay for your goods or service especially if it's not a um, required to live good or service you have to live in a house so you kind of have to pay rent uh, even if it goes up but if you're looking to buy um, you know fruit loops and those go up you either don't buy them or you get the off-brand fruit loops and whoever owns the main label fruit loops probably kellogg's they're the ones that have to pay the price there so these costs inflation doesn't really uh uh it 
the cost of that gets passed along to the consumer, but also the small business if you're not dealing with like a core a core need like shelter, water um, kind of thing, or food if you have choices. So um, I, I don't really think that this is this is a, a, a good thing, but it's also expected. Um, I've been hammering this for the past six months. Interest rates are not dropping anytime soon. Um, the market said six months ago that uh, you know they got excited because the Fed said they're going to drop interest rates in 2024 if inflation goes down and stays down, but it's not going down or staying down. So um, people said, oh yeah, inflation is going to go down and we are going to get interest rate dr uh, dips. I, I can't predict the future, but what I can tell you is we are not going to see interest rate drops until inflation is under three for an extended period of time. And now it just went back up. So the, the market is getting hammered the last couple of days because people realize that they're not going to lower interest rates in June. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe in like the fall, but it went from six interest rate cuts to maybe one or two. And that, that bums people out because when inflation um, is down, that's a good thing. And that also means they can lower interest rates because interest rates is kind of the only way to fight inflation. Interest rate increases to make the cost of money more so people spend it less. Um, and that's what's happening. The cost of money is going to be up. And myself included and other small businesses, which you know operate most of this country, um, they borrow money at uh, from the banks and things like that. And it's not costing. It's costing us more money to borrow money. Therefore, we can do less with money. So, kind of one of those things where um, it. I'm not surprised by it. I would be I would be shocked if we get more than one interest rate dip this year. I think we're more likely to get zero interest rate dips than two or more. So that's just my thoughts. Who knows for sure? But I just everybody tries to predict and do this. But um, I just know that they're not going to drop interest rates until inflation is under control. And inflation is clearly not under control right now. I think that was proven. So there's my thoughts on the headlines. Interesting, interesting stuff we got going on there. All right, so what we got next is a, a deal of the week. We need to come up with some fun, um, some fun like uh, sponsors and terminology and all that. But we're not worried about that right now. Our goal is to just provide good value, like have a good podcast, have a good show. Um, visually um, and then audio for you all and and teach and give value then we'll figure out all that other stuff fun stuff so we'll, we'll come up with some jingle for deal of the week but right now it's just deal o the week so this is my very first flip now not my very first deal uh, this was in 2016 is when lucas and i did this deal um we had probably eight or nine rentals at this point you see our, see our initial thought was to uh to buy rentals to replace our income and we quickly realized that was not going to ever happen we had to get active income so we started to get into the flipping game and this was our very first flip this was a burn house meaning it was there was a big fire in the house and the roof got replaced and that was it so this house was literally our 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 first major rehab our first fix and flip and this is typical lucas and, and sam style this thing was down to the studs. I'm telling you, there was an electric box in the basement that was on, but there was no wires ran throughout the house, so there was no electric through the house. There was no insulation. There was um, it was sticked up. It was there was um, some you know some stick walls, but that was it. Obviously, the, the or the external was fine. Um, they got that all buttoned up, but internally, you walk in the house, you're talking um, you're talking uh, hard. You're, you're not talking hardwood. You're talking like plywood floors. You're talking um, no insulation, no drywall, no paint, no cabinets, no anything, just wood, no electric, no HVAC ran, nothing because it was burned and, and you know, watered and damaged and everything. So, uh, you know, that was a, an interesting way to start the deal. So I'm going to kind of show you the numbers, talk through the numbers a little bit with you, kind of give you some insight on what our very first deal looked like. And then we're going to talk lessons learned, which I think is probably the most important part. So stick around for that. So um, we actually got the property from our future business partner. We didn't know it at the time. Um, I was just looking at pictures of this that we were going to use to kind of flash up here. Um, uh, you know to show you like uh you know the the befores and afters and things like that as you'll see popping up if you're watching the, the recording but um you know i was looking back at this time and this was we just got back from luke's bachelor party uh which is kind of funny um he was getting married during this process um and we were you know I, we both had full-time jobs and we decided hey let's buy a, a burn house as our first flip because the numbers just looked uh looked pretty good um we ended up buying it from a local house uh buying company called faster house 
house, which Lucas and I own now, which is kind of unique and ironic. So we bought it from the former owner, Brian, at the time I talked with him. I remember going to get fitted for Lucas uh, for a tux uh, for Lucas's wedding. And uh, I negotiated and we got it for $82,000. So we was a private money lender uh, to buy it for the $82,000. And we figured it needed like of course, we figured it needed like 50, 60 grand was worth 222, 30. Um, so we're like, there's a, you know, a 70K spread here. Let's do this and let's get 70K, which is uh, at the time what Luke's made in a year. So we're like, let's do this. Um, little did we know it was going to cost a lot more work than we thought. A shocker there. We're still running into that. And then we didn't quite sell it for what we thought because uh, um, the market wasn't super strong in 2016. So we bought the property. We ended up putting about 80, uh, 85,000 in it. So we got, you know, the 82 to buy it. We got 50 grand from our private lender and we had to go back to him a couple times and get more. Um, he, you know, had done a few deals with us on our rental. So he was, you know, pretty comfortable with us. And he came and checked on the property a few times to realize, yeah, it just needs more than we thought. And uh, we did a ton of the work ourselves. Um, you can see pictures that ha will have popped up or will pop up Lucas painting and the entire house with, uh, you know, with uh, without having a, a suit on the backyard had an above ground pool that was just needed to be taken out. It was so it was a, it was a nightmare. I remember getting bids on um, insulation and drywall, getting three bids on everything from like basically new build style. So we've never done a new build but we kind of did on our very first flip um so you know got pretty much everything replaced or everything is uh, was replaced in the house um so we ended up taking like probably eight months to do this nine months to do this so way longer than we thought so our money costs were over um our rehab costs went over so we were probably all in this thing for 175 ish 180 and we listed it at 219 to try to you know get a little bit of, at least get a little bit out of it and end up dropping it a couple of times we sold it for 208 um and i don't know the exact amount i think we probably made 25 ish uh 20 to twenty five thousand on this which isn't horrible we learned a lot but i mean it took us nine months we probably spent a couple hundred hours each there so it was not a very good use of our time aside from what we learned what we learned was much more valuable than than the money we made on it so probably you know after taxes and all those things you know we were each able to pocket eight 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 nine grand or something like that max so good okay eh, not great for sure but but we learned a lot so um some of the lessons that we learned were you know, don't get in over your head. Obviously, be a little more conservative on your time frames and your rehab budgets. And and I just remember doing things like, did we need to do that? So it was a it was a three, um, it was a, a, a three a three two. It had a uh, you know one side of the house had like you know a dining room and a kitchen. The other side of the house had two bedrooms and, and a shared bath, hallway bath, and then a master with a master bath. And we thought, you know, if someone's buying this house, that's a small family and they have people over, they're not going to want to have people, you know, going to the bathroom and washing their hands in their kid's bathroom. So we, um, so we ended up um, adding a half bath by the laundry room which sounds simple, but it wasn't. There you see some pictures if you're watching, there's Lucas and, and our main contractor, Brian. Um, we ended up uh, you know, having to dig out the, uh, there's Lucas just crushing those hurricane clips. Um, but we had, to, we had to dig out the cut and dig out, now we had someone hired to do it, the, the, uh, to create a, uh, a drain flow in the basement. So um, you know, we added a half bath, but then we had to cut out the concrete, um, dig, uh, get buckets of cut up concrete and dirt up the stairs because there wasn't a walkout to dump outside to then put in the pipes to add the half bath to then um, reconcrete over top of that. So again, it was, you know, did we really need to do that? Was that half bath that important? It was definitely a great bonus, but, you know, the market wasn't super strong at the time. We ended up not, you know, not selling for really anywhere near asking, honestly, about 95% of asking. So, um, you know, it, it, did we need to do stuff like that? Was it too big of a project? I feel like we kind of made it work the best we could and we learned a lot, but um, in, in general, it just was probably a little bit too big for us. We probably could have done two smaller flips in that same time frame and made more money. There you can see we, we did really nice stuff. Like we added those half, those, you know, quarter walls and then those um and you know those beams that added the curves again because it was just sticks so we we added quite a bit and we we didn't cut any corners we made it really nice in fact it uh i just looked it up it is uh it is at currently a rental and it's worth well over three hundred thousand right now so think of it that way it it um you know so it last sold in 21 so it's gone up it last sold 21 for three hundred thousand dollars so um you can see pictures of it if you're watching right now on the screen and it was um 
you know, so it's gone up since 2021. Everybody knows that. So it's probably three hundred forty thousand dollar house. Um, and, you know, so it was worth two hundred and eight grand in 2016. So in seven years, it's gone up 50 percent in value. Um, uh, so just do the math there. That real estate's in a good area of town, uh, in a nice little neighborhood that's affordable. You know, uh, a two thousand square foot uh, ranch, three bed, uh, three bath, uh, with a basement and a nice backyard for three hundred forty grand. So it's still uh, three hundred twenty, whatever you want to call it. So still, still a good deal. But uh, um, yeah, just goes to show the the craziness and, and the the power of of real estate. What happens over over a short period of time um, in a good area. Uh, in a good market. So learned a lot of lessons, but in general, just just found out that it was a little bit more than we should have been getting into. Uh, but we made it work and learned a ton and made some good connections with some contractors that we we still use to this day. But we put a lot of time and effort into it. And, and I remember on listing um, the morning that we listed it, um, we ended up having a, a, a pretty major leak on the outside of the house. This is crazy. So you'll see the pictures. If it's not popped up, you'll see it in the B-roll, but um, on the recording. But like we had, there was a, a water pipe going from the street to the house, uh, from the you know the main the main sewer supply or the main water supply to the house, and there was a a, a, a root about the size. There you go. You see Brian inside that hole. We dug that all by hand. There was a root probably the size of two softballs um, that uh, had engulfed that pipe, and then just over 30 years probably, and just. The day that we listed was there. You see the, the picture of that. Look at that. The day that we listed, just squeezed it a little too tight, and it caused this this huge mud pit in the front of the um, house that we had to, uh, you know, dig up, find where the leak was, right, because you're digging through mud and water, and the water fills up. And then, you know, you shut off the water, but the the, uh, the street, we had to find that, but the water fills it up and gets muddy, and you can't find. It's not like it's digging through something that, like, you know, you can just, like, blocks and pull them away and see where the leak is so anyways that was just stuff like that happens it was definitely interesting um to learn it and see it but that that's kind of what happens with real estate uh luke's and i've always been pretty good about just rolling with the punches and that's kind of i think why we are where we are today so that was that first deal um we learned a lot uh hopefully you got found some interesting things and, and realized that it's uh it does take a lot of uh you have to go wade through a lot of shit to actually uh to see any substantial um substantial positives on the other side in any avenue uh, real estate uh, notwithstanding so all right we are getting ready to get on to the uh, motivation wednesday we got we got an original ish quote so i thought of this quote to talk about today because i have uh seen a lot of people complaining recently about the market and it's not getting better anytime sooner prices aren't going down Interest rates aren't going down either. So we're stuck with this for the foreseeable future. If prices do go down, um, well, prices won't go down. If interest rates do go down, um, then prices will go up. So it's going to offset any of that interest rate go uh, it decrease. So we're just in a phase of American history that real estate is going to cost a lot of money. It's still very, fairly affordable when you look at countries in Europe, um, over in Japan, over in a lot of areas of China. Real estate costs a lot more um, poor per dollar that someone makes um, than it does um, in the U.S. And I think we're getting there. Obviously, there's countries that are cheaper, but U.S. is going to become just a more expensive place to own real estate. Nothing we can do about it. So what I what I have for the quote today is I, I cannot control the market around me, but I can control how I react to the market around me. So this just I wanted to get into this a little bit. I This is kind of a I, I've never heard somebody word it that exact way, but I've heard this quote so many times. You can't control, you know, everything, but you can't control how you react to everything. So I've seen this quote about a ton of different places. So I don't want to take full credit for it. But um this is um, something that I have seen has been kind of on my mind a little bit recently because I can't control that the government's spending money over in, in, in Ukraine and over in Israel and, and over all over the world. I, I can't control interest rates. I can't control inflation. Um, I can't control if my tenants lose their job or not. I, I can't control a lot of things. But what I can 100% control is my reaction to those things, how I specifically react to that. Like, is it something that I am, you know, get mad about, uh, figure out a solution around, something that, that sinks me for a little bit or something that I um, can quickly pivot and, and see an opportunity where there is an issue. Um, most opportunities come from issues. They don't come from, um, you know, just 
everything being hunky dory. So I, I, I feel like the most successful people in the world see what is thrown their way and they navigate and they bob and they weave and they come out on top despite and sometimes because of what's thrown their way. The people that get curveballs thrown their way and they don't know how to react or they get, uh, you know, in their fields or they get pissed off or they get sad or they, they, they kind of shell up a little bit. I, I get it. It, it. A lot of this stuff that happens sucks, but those aren't the people that are, are going to win and ultimately be successful. You have to be okay with what's thrown your way and then you have to figure out how you're going to react positively or quickly or proactively to what you see getting thrown your way. I, I read a quote the other day or saw a video, who knows, TikTok, uh, uh, Instagram, whatever, where um, somebody said so the most dangerous people in the world and uh, dangerous meaning like a good thing like powerful dangerous whatever they have the attitude it is what it is um that's that's the very 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 positive and powerful attitude to have something horrible happens it is what it is something really really cool happens it is what it is i think that's a really really cool way to live life and to kind of be on that even keel uh, i i usually don't get too up i usually get don't get too down just kind of live in that that uh that ground of a lot, of, a lot of crappy stuff's happened. Uh, I think my boy T. Jor a couple weeks ago was like, man, I feel bad for you. We got we got TikTok being knocked down. We got webinars bombing. We got a lot of shit coming our way. But it is what it is. Uh, nothing we can do about what happened. And uh, there's not a lot about, that we can do about what's happening. But what we can do, do is, um, you know, take a collective breath. Um, you know, don't act irrationally and just keep going. Eventually, it, it'll turn and we'll get some wind at our back. So... Uh, yeah, that, that's what I got for you today. It was a fun solo episode. It kind of flew by. We're almost at an hour. Uh, I didn't realize that. We're, uh, flew by. It was a lot of fun. Hopefully, if you enjoyed this at all, please share this episode with a friend, whether you're listening or watching um, on, on YouTube or any podcast or, or any other platform we stream on. Share this with anybody you know that's interested in real estate. Give this damn thing a like if you learned one thing today. Um, likes and shares really, really help us, so we would appreciate that very much. We uh, go live every Wednesday and Friday. Um, you know, We have guests on Fridays. Really top-notch guests so it's a it, it this is a, a powerful podcast um we're just getting started we're going to continue to do this and i feel like this is one of the podcasts out there that you can learn and be educated and be entertained at the same time and uh you know you can take this and apply it in your everyday life where normal people doing ex, uh, you know super super abnormal things creating a lot of wealth from nothing and we want to bring you along our journey with us so you can learn with us um, bob and weave as we do and learn from our mistakes so you can go implement it in your everyday life so appreciate very much if you're if you're listening please go give us a rating and a review we'd appreciate that make sure we're on your your weekly listen and then if you're watching uh, like this video share it and uh you know we'd, we'd appreciate any support you can give us peace out thanks for listening to today's episode we hope you got some major value from our conversation if you love what you learn make sure you like rate review the show and help us spread the word by telling a friend if you'd like to learn more about working with me inside one of my programs, we'll have those links in the show notes, along with all our social media handles, so you connect with us there for free. If there's a real estate question you'd like us to answer, feel free to send us a message and we'll cover it in an upcoming show.